All right, welcome, my brothers and my sisters, to the Last Ray podcast. Uh, this is your servant, Brother Michael Verlis, and I'm glad that we can continue to share our thoughts in these series of studies on the experience of salvation. On this podcast today, I have a good friend, a good brother of mine who I've been studying with for a little while. Um, his name is Brother Giovanni, and he'll be sharing some of his comments here and there um, as we're going along in this study. Hey, Giovanni, how you doing? Feeling good? I'm feeling good. How are you, brother? Doing good. Thank the good Lord, man. So we're going to be studying. Um, <laughs> and... Say that one more time. I hope everyone that is listening is having a good day. Amen. Yeah, that's my hope, too. That's my hope, too. And, and for the Lord to have led them to be listening to us even now um, and to be listening to some of the thoughts that we're going to be going through following on uh, the experience of salvation, I believe that it was God ordained. You know, above the distractions of the earth, God sits enthroned. And all things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders what his providence sees is best. That's taken from the book uh, Ministry of Healing on page 417. I believe it's paragraph three uh, where it says that God has ordered our steps to, to this place where we can sit, where we can maybe be in our cars, maybe, where we can maybe be at work uh, or wherever it is that we may be, where we can listen to some of these thoughts on the experience of Salvation. It's the, it's really a very very important uh, a, a series of studies and thoughts that we need to have and understand for ourselves. But most importantly, experience. Um, I remember when we had read that that in the book actually Apostles on page four fifty seven four seventy five I believe it is or four fifty seven four seventy five in paragraph one where it says that the knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. And so this is where our focus is on in these studies. It's really us having the knowledge and the experience of God in Christ. Uh, just what is it that God wants you and I to experience uh, as we enter uh, at, or as we grow in the Christian experience and, and, and go through conversion? So um, right before we pray, I just do want to read a statement from the book, the book Education. It's on page 18. Just to, just to really uh, uh, cover our mind or flavor our mind with, un with, 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 with this thought and understanding as, as we come to study uh, the experience of salvation. It's not just some other study or, 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 or uh, uh, extracurricular activity. It's not a, 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 just a, a side study that you just have. No, this is life. In fact, Jesus says uh, in John 17 and verse 3, uh, and this is life eternal, that they, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Th that is life eternal. So our eternal destinies uh, are, are, are hanging upon whether or not we accept this truth as it is inside of Jesus Christ, the experience of salvation. So in the book Education, uh, page 18, it says, Such an education provides more than mental discipline, much more than mental discipline. It provides more than physical training. It strengthens the character so that truth and uprightness are not sacrificed to selfish desire or worldly ambition. Worldly ambition needs to be laid down. It fortifies the mind against evil. Instead of some master passion becoming a power to destroy, whether it's anger, bitterness, jealousy, hate, every motive and desire are brought into conformity to the great principles of right. As the perfection of his character is dwelt upon, follow this, as the perfection of his character is dwelt upon, the mind is renewed and the soul is recreated in the image of God. The whole idea behind this, the thrust, the cardinal point of everything it is that we are doing and that we do, that we speak, teach, and share or preach is that the soul, your soul, might be recreated in the image of God. And so this education, this learning of the experience of salvation is so that our souls can be recreated in God's image. So in today's study, what we want to look at are three things as we're moving along in the Christian experience. We're going to look at three things. What is repentance? Number one. What leads us to repentance? Number two. And when should I, or when should you, when should the sinner repent? Before or after getting their life in order? These are very important questions because repentance is a great part, an integral, a necessary, an essential, fundamental part of the Christian experience. 
In fact, it, it, it must be one of the first effects of the Christian experience, of the true Christian experience, repentance. And we're going to go into that study even now. But right before we do, we're going to have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time even now where you have blessed us to be able to come and rest a while, to consider the truth as it is in Jesus and the experience that we would have as we submerge ourselves in that truth, as we allow that truth to make us free. Lord, we would see Jesus so that we can experience this thing which your word calls repentance. Father, what is it? How do we attain to it? How do we experience it? When ought we to experience it? Teach us these things in the precious and most holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Cleanse us of all our sins. Amen. 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 So, repentance. Um, so one might ask, like, why, why is it that, that I have to repent? Why do I have to... Uh, uh, you know, kind of embarrass myself and repent um, before the Lord. There's a book in the Bible. It's called Proverbs, a wonderful book filled with Proverbs, of course, wise sayings from the man named Solomon. And, um, and, 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 and in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before the fall. Pride goes before destruction and an haughty spirit before the fall. If we are too prideful to repent, then we are we are driving at full speed towards destruction. And many of us are going to go out and about and blaming God for a destruction that was a result of our resisting repenting to God. We're going to see what repentance is just in a moment, but I just want this to be before our minds. Repentance is essential in the Christian experience. My, Brother Michael, Brother Michael, could you actually go back and say that again? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, but I, I know down here that a lot of brothers and sisters, I, by the way, uh, listener, I live in Texas, so I know a lot of brothers and sisters think that this is God punishing me. This is uh, because God doesn't like what I do. Can you say that very first part again? Yes, yes, that's a very, that's a very, very good point. So, so, so the Bible says in Proverbs 16 and verse 18 that pride goes before destruction. So destruction comes to those who harbor pride within them. Now, now we know that God is love and, and that and everything about God removes pride. It, 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 even God himself, who, who has all power, and we study this in our first study, that he has all power, all knowledge. He can be everywhere at all times and in, in, in everything, but he has no pride in his heart. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls him love, and, and that is to show that he is selfless. That's agape love or altruistic love, altruism, which means all for the other and none for self. That's God. So no pride therein. So anyone who harbors pride within themselves, they suffer destruction, not because God is angry with them or hates them or, 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 want, or, or is looking over them with his lightning bolts ready to throw at them. But rather, it's because they have rejected and pushed God away to such a degree that they themselves have chosen. I want to harbor pride and knowing that it's going to lead to my destruction. You see, the Bible also says in the, uh, that, 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 um, that the eyes of man are never full, meaning that they're never satisfied, always filled with pride. The eyes of man are never satisfied, never satisfied. And so, and so in never being satisfied, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, they continue in their depression or in their anger because they can't satisfy themselves. And that depression and that anger actually works negatively on the body and on the mind, and it leads to self destruction. So pride goes before the fall, it goes before destruction, and then in haughty spirit before the fall. And that's the same thing, in fact, Brother Giovanni, that we see with Lucifer. Lucifer, um, he had uh, pride in his heart. He was filled with pride in his heart. God let him know, look, you're going in the wrong direction. You have sin in your heart and you got to let it go. Now, the reason why I know that is because in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, it said that iniquity was found in his heart. Iniquity. And, and iniquity in Isaiah 59 and verse 12, it says our iniquities, we know them. Our iniquities we know them. And so and so the only way that Lucifer could have known that he had iniquity in his heart was if someone revealed it to him. And the one who revealed it to him in love was God. God revealed to him, look, there's pride in your heart. It's going to your destruction. There's pride in your heart. And, 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 and you, you, you're, you're, you're going to self-destruct. In fact, in the book Patriarch and Prophets, on page 39 in the book Patriarch and Prophets, um, uh, it's a, with, which is a wonderful book that everyone ought to read, on page 39 of 
Patriots and Prophets. It's chapter one entitled, Why Was Sin Permitted? On page 39, and it's on in paragraph one, um, it says, uh, let's see here, and uh, page 39, yes, the time had come for a final decision. He must fully yield to the divine sovereignty, Satan that is, Lucifer that is, that was his name at that point. Lucifer must fully yield to the divine sovereignty or place himself in open rebellion, in open rebellion against God. He nearly reached the decision to return. He nearly reached the decision to return to God. But pride forbade him. Pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error. It was, he, he, he couldn't do it. He couldn't admit that he was in error. Why? Because pride forbade him. He had pride in his heart. And that's what stopped him from doing that, from repenting, from repenting of what he was doing before. And, and, and let's make that a little bit more, 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 more current to, 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 to us who, who are in this world today. Um, there, there, there's lots, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe none of us may be going out and about and saying, I, I, I want to be greater than the Lord. I want to uh, be better than God. But there are certain things that we can take into our minds, some media that we can take in, whether it's books, whether it's movies, whether it's TV shows or whatnot, um, that we could take in or people that we listen to, people that we look up to, that we can listen to that will uh, bring much pride into our hearts. You know, there, there, there are lots of uh, motivational speakers out there that will speak and that will get you really excited, making you feel really good about yourself, whether we're talking about uh, Tony Robbins or Zig Ziglar, um, uh, Les Brown, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad in the Cashflow Quad Quadrant, Dave Ramsey's, or, uh, uh, though he has a more of a Christian bent, um, uh, 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 Eric Thomas. Uh, right? Susie Orman, Napoleon Hill. And I'm not casting any aspersions on these individuals or saying that they're bad in any way to any degree. Um, other than what I have heard about Napoleon Hill, that's a story for another time. He wrote the book, um, uh, Think and Grow Rich, which is which is actually a really spiritualistic book uh, with the famous statement, uh, whatever man's mind can believe uh, or conceive, it can achieve. That's a humanistic uh, thought, uh, which does not promote pride to any degree which did not promote humility rather to any degree, but rather pride when you read the whole book. And I've personally read the whole book, so I'm speaking of an experience that I've had. And I know that one is not indicative of the whole. Me, I can't uh, make my experience be the experience of everyone, but uh, I know what happened to me when I read that book. And, and I actually listened to a man who spoke a little bit about uh, you know, the, 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 what it took for Napoleon Hill to bring that book together. But I digress. I don't want to get too deep into that. But, but the point is that we'll listen to all these uh, people and stuff. And what that actually does without us realizing or knowing is, is it bring pride into our hearts. It really does. I was in sales for several years. Um, I was doing life insurance. Uh, this is when I was in college, so in my college days. And I was, I wanted to, you know, really learn sales and be good at it. Um, you know, being able to speak well and to share an idea with someone and hopefully uh, get their buy-in. And uh, I didn't read his old book, but I read it, uh, you know, certain portions of it, Zig Ziglar. Um, and he was really, really good for that. Zig, he said, uh, he actually had the book entitled See You at the Top. And uh, that book was rejected 39 times before it was published in 1975. And um, 39 times, isn't that something? So that means that, I mean, man, 39 times it was rejected. And so that's a, a story for him. You could say, I, I got rejected 39 times, but I kept on going, kept on going, kept on, kept on going. And that is definitely encouraging. There's an encouraging aspect to that, to continue to push, be persevering, don't stop, be determined. Christ was persevering. Christ was determined, and he did that. But Christ moved forward with humility. So anyway, the, the title of that book is See You at the Top. See You at the Top. Not too many people have made it to the top, but when they got there, they realized that nobody was there. They looked down and got a little bit dizzy and they fell back to reality. Sort of like Lucifer. You remember what he said? He said, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the Mount of, Trent of Congregation in the sides of the north. What? Sit on the sides of the north? That's where God is. In and of our own selves, we are nothing. And before God, less than nothing. That's what Isaiah says in the 40th chapter of his book, chapter, verse 17. 
Before, in the sight of God, we are nothing and less than nothing. God told, said in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So we got to be really careful the things it is that we read, the, the media it is that we consume, because what it can do is it can give us a, a high-minded spirit and it will hinder us from uh, repenting and, 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 and humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord. So what is repentance? This is where we want to come to. We had those three questions. Number one is what is repentance? Number two is uh, how can I have repentance or what leads me to repentance? Or what, what can, you know, how, how do I get into that experience? Because, it's, again, it's an integral part, integral part of the Christian experience. Uh, and, and, and when do I repent? Well, what is repentance? In the book Steps of Christ, that's the book that we're looking at. The two books it is that we have is the Bible and the book Steps of Christ. And um, what is repentance? I, I appreciate the way that it's said in the book Steps of Christ. And um, it lets us know there on page 23 what repentance is. And I, and I encourage everyone to have the book. It's on page 23 in paragraph three, 2. It says, repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. So repentance is not only sorrow for sin, feeling bad for your sins, but repentance is turning away from your sins. Meaning you're going in one direction, and th but then after that you, you turn around and you go the exact opposite direction. So if you have pride in your heart, then you're walking towards destruction. We read that in, Pro in Proverbs chapter 16. Uh, pride leadeth to destruction. That's where it leads to. It leads to destruction. But now repentance leads to Christ. And, and, and so that's why we say that, 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 that it's, repentance is certainly uh, one of the first effects, or the first effect, really, of experiencing the love of Jesus Christ. It's that we turn from, so we not only sorrow for sin, but we turn away from destruction to Christ. So we begin our steps to Christ. And we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. I continue reading. There are many who fail to understand the true Wait. nature. Oh, yeah, Brother Giovanni, you're going to say Brother. something. So as you were saying, we walk by faith and not by sight. Mm -hmm. You just reminded me of Hebrews 11, verse 1. Uh -huh. All right. Let me see if I can find it. No oh, problem. The most no. famous definition definition of faith, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. There it is. 11 verse 1. Okay, here it is. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. That's right. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And yes. so though we don't see Christ, but it is by faith that we take our steps to him. Uh -huh. Praise God. Very good thought. All right. So continuing here with that thought, continuing with that line. With that little catapult that Brother Giovanni just set up. There are many who fail to understand the true nature of repentance. Multitudes sorrow that they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear that their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. They lament the suffering rather than the sin. The limit, the suffering rather than the sin. You see, that's not repentance. If that's a repentance, that, that I, I would call that a repentance inspired by selfishness. But you see, repentance is not inspired by selfishness, but rather by selflessness. Uh -huh. True repentance we're talking about, right? Uh -huh. True repentance does not is not a result of selfishness. So, uh, and the example that, that's given here is, uh, is of Esau, of of. Uh, of Judas and a couple of other individuals who they didn't repent uh, uh, because of their love for God or because of their conviction of sin, but rather they repented uh, because 
uh, they were afraid of the results, the consequences. They, 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 they shied away. They didn't want to deal with the results and the consequences of the choice that they made. That was the mm-hmm. issue. That was the thing. And you know what? Mm-hmm. This actually kind of because I'm also I also work at a school. Okay. This reminds me of uh, actually kids when they get in trouble. They're not actually they they don't they're not they're not sorrowful for what they did. They're sorry that they got caught. That now they have to deal with the repercussions of I don't know of um, drawing on the wall somewhere or. I'm just brainstorming things or just doing something they weren't supposed to. It's not the, it's not that they're, it's not that they're all sorry for, they're not sorry for like doing it. They're sorry that they're now have to deal with the repercussions of their actions. Right. Now you're going to get a demerit or you're going to get detention yeah. or, or, or maybe suspension yeah. depending upon the degree of what it is that they did that was wrong. That, that, that is yeah. absolutely, that's absolutely true. That is that is very very true. I mean, and and it's not as though you're even judging the heart because you were in the same place. I was in the same place where we were in school. Maybe we've oh, done yeah. something wrong, right? Yes. And then we're oh, like, yeah. oh my goodness, my father's gonna find out, my mother's gonna find out, she's gonna be stressed oh, out, she's gonna be frustrated, yes. and uh, we're gonna hear it. But that mm-hmm. is but that is not true repentance. That's not true repentance. And and a lot of people in the time of the end, those individuals that are saying, uh, 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 "Mountains fall upon me, uh, hide me from the face uh, of of him that cometh." Right. Jesus had let them know already in the book of Proverbs. He said uh, that in this Proverbs 8 and verse 36, where the Bible says, but he that sinneth against me, that's against Christ, because the book of Proverbs is every time it's, it's particularly, especially in chapter eight, it's speaking about Christ um, quite a bit, how he was the delight of the father, that he was brought up with him in verse 30, um, uh, uh, not not brought up by him, but brought up with him. A very important point. But um, he, he goes on to say in verse 36, But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that they that hate me love death. So they chose to hate Christ. They chose not to take steps towards Christ, but to continue in their prior toward destruction. And when destruction comes, it's the result of them uh, loving death, but, but, but they want to shy away from that. So there's, they've lived a life which, in which, where they loved death, but when it actually came, they're like, Oh, no, no, I don't think I want, I, I don't think I want that. I, I don't think I want to deal with that. And so true repentance, though, true repentance, turning away from destruction, you're not even turning away from destruction because you don't want to suffer destruction, but rather you're turning away from destruction because you have been wooed by the love of Christ. So this is another level, Brother Giovanni. Brother Joe, this is another level. And and you that are listening, this is another level of love and a desire for the Christian experience. It's not because, oh, I want to be saved. And it's not merely because, oh, I don't want to be lost. The, 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 the reason for repentance is not, is not selfish. It's not because if you're saying, I just want to be saved, that's selfish. That's I want to, that's selfish. And neither is it, I don't want to be lost. I don't want to suffer in hellfire. I don't want to um, endure uh, what are the, the just results of my actions. I, I, I don't want to go through that. No, that, 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 the, that is not the, the true reason for repentance and it's really important that we get that it's not selfish at all the true reason for repentance is 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 told is told to us in the word of god in the book of romans in chapter 2 and verse 4 so that goes into now into our second question of what leads us to repentance what exactly leads us to repentance so in romans chapter 2 chapter 2 yes sir you want to get that for us or despite it yeah, I got it. Okay. Or despitest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of the God leadeth thee to repentance. That's right. Don't you know that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? It's his goodness that leads that, that leads us to repentance. It's when we see the the mercy of and the kindness, the sacrifice of God in Christ, it's that that leads us to repentance. Not our fear of punishment. And, yeah, go ahead. And it's it's honestly, like, we we learned this stuff as we were kids. For example, the song, How I Love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how mm-hmm. I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. 
Amen. Exactly. It starts. <laughs> it starts with him loving us first. Yes. And we we often we oftentimes uh like disregard these things as just like oh they're for children so children can learn the uh learn the basics but these basics are God's message. It's like we oftentimes uh times extremely complicate things. I believe it was in the Desire of Ages. I can't remember the exact page where she says uh watch out for your own uh, watch out for your own zeal because your own zeal will lead you into the path of destruction yes and uh and uh she she's completely right by by saying this um our our own zeal our own uh want for a bigger more grand um kingdom as the disciples did, as the disciples were looking for, as Jesus was on this world saying, Lord, uh, Lord, we should lift you up to the highest kingdom, so on and so forth. But he rebuking his disciples saying, my kingdom is not on this, not, this not of this earth. Yes. Yeah, not of this world. We consistently look for, for more, but this simple message as is, is the, is just, is honestly just perfect. Yes. And what we need. Yes. And yeah, and what we need. You're you're absolutely that's absolutely correct. You know, those those children's songs it is that we that we learned, they they were packed with truth and um and we can tend to kind of be like, Oh, that that's that, that that's 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 for children. But the Bible says, Train up a child in the way which he shall go, and he will never depart from those ways. And we were uh-huh. trained, but we done departed from those ways. We haven't held on to the faith of that song that says, oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And we thought to ourselves that there's something that we do. The, 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 the choice it is that, 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 that we make that initiate, that, that, that moves God to do something for us. Uh-huh. And, we, and it's not the case because the Bible, as you just said, makes it very, very clear that it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I actually just have the desire of ages right here because there was a statement that had uh, popped into my mind as, as, as you were sharing your thoughts and as I was saying something previously. And it's on page 480. It's in paragraph uh, three of 480 uh, in Desire of Ages. And it says, it is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love Revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of him attracts, it softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholder. They hear his voice and they follow him. So their motive is not the fear of punishment or, 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 or the strong desire for reward, but rather Christ's true disciples. The reason for them repenting or turning away from their sins, turning away from destruction and pride is because of the love and the matchless charms of Jesus Christ. The You're, funny part mm-hmm. about what you just read is that I have the same exact verse underlined. Wow. The one spirit, one spirit. So is that so then so then brother Joe is so then that means it's that love of God is that love of God which is the in, which is the initiating factors the first thing it's the number one thing above all things and it is that that then that that then uh, 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 moves us inspires us to repentance in fact there's a book called uh, Councils on Health and in that book on page two hundred and twenty two in paragraph two of the book Councils on Health page two twenty two in paragraph two something very significant is said there. My good friend Pastor Koku he often uh, references this, uh, this 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 uh, this statement here. And, and notice with me what it says. It says this. It says this. And this is concerning the love of God and what it does. And th- it's so beautiful. I just love it. I'm like I gotta read this thing. It says it says the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race and the father and son and the Holy spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption in order to fully carry out this plan. It was decided that Christ, the only begotten son of God should give himself an offering for sin. What line can measure the depth of this love? God would make it impossible for man to say that he could have done more. 
With Christ, he gave all the resources of heaven that nothing might be wanting in the plan for man's uplifting. Here is love, the contemplation of which should fill the soul with inexpressible gratitude. Oh, what love, what matchless love. The contemplation of this love, when we spend time contemplating and meditating and studying this love, it will cleanse the soul from all selfishness. And I will add, it will cleanse the soul from all pride so that we will not go in the way of destruction, but rather we will, we will repent and begin taking our steps to Christ. It will lead the disciple to deny self, take up the cross and follow the Redeemer. You see, that's the end of the quote. That is what this love does. The contemplation of this love, what it does is that it cleanses our soul of sin. It cleanses our soul of selfishness. It cleanses our soul of wickedness, depression, anger, and all of that stuff that, 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 that ought not be in us. All that stuff that, that, that we don't need to have. And I, and I said depression, and, 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 and I mean that. I really mean that. You know, I scroll on, on the line from time to time and um, on social media and stuff. And one thing that I've seen has really been spiking in terms of conversations and things that people see really needs to be addressed. And this does need to be addressed. It is uh, mental health. People often talk about mental health and, and, and various different statuses are posted. Um, and it's pretty much the same idea. I mean, the structure is basically the same. It's just different words that are used. And it's the same exact thing that everyone is saying, just in different ways. Um, uh, and basically, it just simply says uh, that I'm either I'm not going to do this, this and that because I need to take care of my mental health or I'd rather take a, a job paying less uh, because because um, uh, this higher paying job is just too taxing. And and I want I got to take care of my mental health. Some things I just got to do for my sanity or this for my mental health. This for my and there's a huge it's as though there's been a huge mental health issue going on for the past maybe three, four or five years. And, and surely this is not something new. It's something that's been going on for a very long time, but, and fomenting for quite a bit, but, but, but it's really been bubbling much more of late where people are talking about mental health and depression and, and all these issues that are going on in society today, especially even among, um, young, uh, uh, us young people. And, and my thing is this, as Christians, we, uh, this is not something that needs to be in the Christian experience. It is not something that needs to be in the Christian experience. I'm not saying it's not something that will never be in, in a Christian's experience. I'm saying it doesn't need to be therein. It doesn't need to be therein. I speak against it. I defy any thought that depression or, or anything of that nature needs to be in the Christian experience. It doesn't need to be in it. And I'm by no means saying that, that we ought not go to a counselor or to a therapist if we need help. Absolutely. And in fact, the Bible speaks against that. The Bible says that there is wisdom in the multitude of counselors. And the, the Bible calls Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter nine, the wonderful counselor. And if Christ is working in you and in me and in various other individuals, it, it, you, it behooves you, meaning it has made your duty. It, you would do well to go in their midst who have the wonderful counselor dwelling in their hearts to counsel and to help you with whatever issue it is that you, that, that you may have. But you know, I, when Jesus says, when he comes to this world, will he find faith? Faith is something that's found in the mind. When we have faith, when we have the faith of Jesus Christ, then things like depression are overcome because, because it's plain that God does not inspire depression in any man. He does not bring depression in any heart. In fact, he says in the book of Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusteth in thee. Jesus asked the question, he said, before coming to this world, Will, will, will the son of man find any faith? In fact, he also says, he also says that, 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 that in the time of the end, in the latter days, which is the time that we're living in right now, he says that man's heart will fail for fear. Man's heart will fail for fear. So this is just another identifying mark of the fact that we are living in the time of the end. The fact that man's heart are failing for fear. And though some will not say, oh, I'm not, a, will not admit that their heart is failing for fear. But when, when we talk about mental health issues, and that is the heart failing for fear. Why? Because there is a lack of faith. Because there's a lack of it giving up to Christ. 
let me tell you something if we have if we have the christian experience to the degree that it is our privilege to have it then just like christ depression will 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 will, will come at you you will he, he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin he was tempted in all points so he felt the pull of depression he felt the pull of of anxiety he felt the pull but he was never overcome by it but he always overcame. If we keep on coming to Christ, that is how we become overcomers. So if you who are listening, if anyone who is listening is suffering from depression or anxiety or frustration or, or, or anger or, or bitterness or any of these things, I'm telling you, it does not need to be a part of the Christian of your Christian experience. It does not need to be a part thereof. I, I, I refuse. I refuse to live believing that it needs to be a part of it. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. So seek for help and know that God is extending. Hold to God's unchanging hand. He's extending his help to you. You don't need to remain and to dwell in that situation. You don't need to dwell therein. Don't need to dwell therein. In fact, God wants to give us the power to repent, to turn away from that experience. He wants us to turn away from that so that we can experience life more abundant and free life more abundant and free right. brother joe you want to say something yeah right. I, I i know you have yeah. something bubbling inside of you brother what's going on yeah so uh um in the desire of ages um page 83 and 82 i'm gonna read uh the paragraph um paragraph one through paragraph four and i'm gonna skip back to 82 in paragraph two and i'm gonna skip back to uh, 83 and read paragraph one okay so you're on page 80 right now 83. 83, okay, cool. I'm following you. 83, paragraph 4. It would be well for us to spend a, a thoughtful hour each day in the comp, in the comp, uh, contemplation yes. of the life of Christ. Yes. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing, closing ones. As we dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more consistent, our love quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of patience and humility at the foot of the cross. Now I'm going to skip back to uh, page 82, paragraph 2, and it's, I believe... One, two, three, four, five lines above. It reads, God desired that they should be led to prayerful study and meditation in regard to the, in regard to Christ's mission. And so I'm going to skip back to 83, first paragraph. And listen to this, brothers and sisters, because this is extremely important. By one day's neglect, Mm. They have lost the Savior, mm. but it cost them three days of anxious search to find him. So with us, by idle talk, evil speaking, or neglect of prayer, we may in one day lose the Savior's presence, and it may take many days of sorrowful search to find him and regain the peace that we have lost. Mm. So... One simple day mm -hmm. of let, let's even link this back to uh, repentance. Mm -hmm. If we take our eyes off of Christ, if we stop repenting for one single day, we have lost the peace. Mm -hmm. We have lost our eyes that were on Christ before, and that may take us many sorrowful days yeah. of searching. And it doesn't have to be that way. It yeah, doesn't, it it doesn't, doesn't have, have to be, be that way. way. What we have to do is shift our focus and keep our focus on Christ. You know, as you're mm -hmm. saying what you're just saying, the, the, the verse that just popped in my mind is, um, is in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah says, uh, uh, sir, uh, and, and the Lord speaking through Isaiah, he says, search for me while I may yet be found. We have to search for the Lord while, while he may yet be found. Let's not... Uh, 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 be negligent in our constant search of God and, and, and looking after him and looking at him. 
He says, and the good news at least is that even if we may have fallen away or or, or, or looked away or whatnot, uh, God hasn't taken his eye off of us. And and he says in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, uh, rather in verse 13, he says, and you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And so it just always brings the heart back to the place of repentance and denial of self in order to receive the fullness of God. And that repentance, that repentance, you know, how, how, you know, how we get it, as we were just covering just now, is by continuously looking at Christ and studying his love, the goodness of God and the good things that he has done for us in our personal lives, but also what he's done for us over 2,000 years ago. And we studied that in our previous lesson. We saw that, 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 that Christ, he, he, and I often like to put this in this picture because I remember when I first considered it that way, it really meant a lot to me that he stood on the edge of his throne to dive into a situation which would have eternal ramifications. He, he, the word became flesh. He, he became one of us. He became one with us. He identifies with us. He has linked himself with humanity by ties that are never to be broken, ever. He, he, he has suffered eternal consequences, eternal consequences to become one with you. And, 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 and in him doing that, the, the, the Bible teaches that the Son of God became the Son of Man, right? So that the sons of men could become the sons of God. He became one flesh with us so that we can become one spirit with him. That's what he did. He became one. And that's what the Bible says, in fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Now, it doesn't say that, like that verbatim, but, um, but it does say that in principle, absolutely. So it's not eisegesis, uh, but, but I'll read exactly what it says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 17. It says, it says, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now, the only way that we are joined to the Lord is because the Lord has first joined himself to us. You know, we love him because he first loved us. So God is the initiator in all of this. His love is the initiating factor, it is the beginning, it is the alpha and the omega. And, and the power that is within, the consistency throughout the, the, the Christian experience. He, he, he joined himself to us. How? He became us. He partook of the same. He partook of our human nature and our weaknesses. He took upon himself all of our bad equipment. All of it, our, our diseases, our infirmities, our weaknesses. Christ took that upon himself. He who was rich became poor so that you and I who are poor might become, through his poverty, we might become rich. Become rich. That's right. So, 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 he, so as the Bible says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So he became one flesh with us so that we can now become one spirit with him. So it's his spirit that now joins with us and that's how we become partakers of the divine nature and that love that intelligence that experience that the holy spirit gives us as we see the love of god towards us his goodness the situation that we were in that only god could take us out of we see that the spirit leads us to repentance i want to read two texts that say that i want to read two texts that say that the first one is acts chapter 11 acts chapter 11 and this is reading from verse 16, 15 to verse 18. You're going to see this. It says, and, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them as one at the beginning. And as, the, as one, at, one of us, as on us, rather, at the beginning. And then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said that John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Verse 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So you see here, the Bible says that God granted the Gentiles repentance unto life. God is the one that gave them repentance. So they didn't have it. And now it was given to them as a gift. They didn't work for it, but God gave it to them as a gift, repentance unto life. Now it's their choice to accept it, but God has given to them repentance unto life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, brother. Cause I was just about to say uh, that we might have to make clear to some of the brothers and sisters listening that it's something that you and I 
have to accept because these gifts are freely given. But if you and I don't accept it, that's that's on us. That's it's right. You not accepting it. That's it's right. It's not that God says that only these people can have it. Only those people can have it. This is freely. Uh, I believe it's in Matthew that all, all these gifts are freely given unto you, freely given unto others. That's these right. gifts have been freely given to us as as not just a single nation, not the United States only has repentance or forgiveness as a people, as yeah. a as the human the race. World, the world has. Yeah. The human race has repentance. That's right. It has been given to the human race in the person of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is our righteousness. Amen. Everything that God expects from you and from me, he has accomplished it in Jesus Christ. God puts no requirement upon you that he did not accomplish already in Jesus Christ. And we find in Christ that Christ repented for us. Christ confessed for us. Christ lived for us. Christ did all things for us. Now do we accept it? Do we, do, do we appropriate it in our own life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Because again, it's the Holy Spirit that does that work. Is the Holy Spirit that does that work of giving unto us righteousness, of giving us, uh, unto us the experience of repentance. There's also 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25. This, that's a very good one, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25. And there the Bible says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance. So God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So God gives us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So, I mean, this thing is so plain that repentance is a gift from God. How do we get it? How, we, are, we are led to repentance by God. We get rep repentance from God. So it's the Holy Spirit that, that lovingly and gently woos us into repentance opening our intellect and our understanding and our mental faculties of what he's doing. And as we see the matchless charms of Jesus Christ as presented to us by the Holy Spirit, who Jesus Christ said he would represent him, he would glorify him, then we are led to repentance. It is not a power that is within us. It is a power that is wholly outside of us. It is God's power that works uh, around us and uh, in our minds so that we can do ch and choose to do the right thing. I, I, I really love the way that Sister White puts it in the book Steps of Christ on page 25 in paragraph three. She says, a repentance such as this is beyond the reach of our own power to accomplish. It is obtained only from Christ who ascended up on high and has given gifts unto men. So you see, this is something that Christ has given. This is a gift from heaven. This is a heavenly gift from God who is eternal. This is a heavenly gift that God has given to us, this repentance. So now this leads to our last and final question as we wind down. God gives us the repentance. It's his love that inspires us towards that through his Holy Spirit working in our hearts, causing us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Amen. But, 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 but when should the sinner repent? When should you repent, you're asking? Because this is the Christian experience. In the Christian experience, we see that the first thing is, is God. It's his love. And that love is what leads us to repentance. But, 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 but when? When do we repent? Before? Getting our life in order or after getting our life in order? When do we repent? And really, the question is, is it doesn't really make the most sense. It doesn't make much sense at all, in fact, because uh, be, because because repentance is, is, as we just saw, it is a gift from God. It is not you doing anything to clean yourself up. You, you, you can't clean yourself up. You cannot clean. As a matter of fact, it's when you were dirty that Christ paid the redemption price for you. It's when you were messed up. It's when you were not right that Christ came and did the right thing for you and as you. It's when you were no good that he who is the only one that is good came and did a work that would now lead you to repent. That would now lead you to turn away from your old ways. It is impossible for us to repent first. 
it is impossible for us to repent first because it is always God who takes the first step. He does it first. We can do nothing except it is God that does it first. The change comes by beholding. It's us beholding the love of God in Christ that leads to the change in our life. In Steps of Christ, on page 26, I'll read a little bit of what it says. It says, The Bible doesn't teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. Peter made the matter clear in his statement uh, to the Israelites when he said, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance. You see that he's quoting Acts chapter five. She's quoting Acts chapter five, and verse 31 for the savior for to give repentance. Or you see that for to give forgive. That's the word forgiveness right there for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So Christ, he gives repentance and he gives forgiveness. The same one who forgives you is the same one who gives you uh, repentance in your heart to walk away from your sin. I continue reading. Christ is the source of every right impulse. He is the only one that can implant in the heart enmity against sin. He's the source of every right impulse, every desire for truth and purity, every conviction of our own sinfulness is an evidence that his spirit is moving upon our hearts. If you are convicted of your sin, you know, God doesn't want to just leave you in your conviction, but he wants to move you along into conversion. Because when, you, when you're when you convicted, you know where convicts go? Convicts go to jail. But God wouldn't leave us in jail. He wants to, the Bible says that he who the son makes free, he is free indeed. And so God doesn't just leave us uh, in our conviction. He doesn't just leave us convicted, but he moves us into conversion to walk out of the prison house, you see. To walk in newness of life, not by the energy of the flesh, but we walk by faith and not by sight, not by any works of righteousness, which we have done. But he loved us and he extended his grace and his mercy and his long loving arms towards us, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. He is a love. He doesn't do anything for himself. He does all for the other, for the benefit of this human race who and people that don't even care. People that don't even care. I really appreciate the way that it's put in the book, Christ's Object Lessons, it's on page 189. I got to read this one, Christ's Object Lesson, page 189. It's such an important statement. I mean, when I, when, when, you know, I've read the book, Christ's Object Lesson a couple times, and, 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 and I remember it was a brother of mine. His name is Brother Eugene Preval. And he read this statement, and um, my heart just melted again. It says that it was taught by the Jews that before God's love is extended to the sinner, he must first repent. That's what the Jews taught, that before God's love is extended to the sinner, he must first repent. In their view, repentance is a work by which men earn the favor of heaven. And it was this thought, it was this thought that led the Pharisees to exclaim in astonishment and anger, this man receiveth sinners. According to their ideas, he should permit none to approach him, but those who had repented. But in the parable of the lost sheep, Christ teaches that salvation does not come through our seeking after God, but through God seeking after us. There is none that understandeth. There is a none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. Romans 3 verse 11 and 12. We do not repent in order that God may love us, but he reveals to us his love in order that we may repent. That statement bro is so beautiful. Yeah, Brother Giovanni. You were just speaking about the humility of Jesus Christ and how he came down and how that was humility. It's just something kind of popped in my head mm. just now. Um, It's, on in desire of ages uh page 49 mm -hmm. it's in the very first first top big paragraph and it reads it would have been an, an almost, almost infinite, infinite humiliation mm -hmm. for the son of god to take man's nature even when adam stood in 
his innocence mm -hmm. in Eden. Mm -hmm. And another thing actually popped in my mind uh, when me and you were having Bible study a while ago to to really relate that and just bring this home to to, sub, to somebody, a great analogy. So we, we all know roaches, right, brothers and sisters? We all know roaches. <laughs> they fly, look gross. I, I personally live in Texas, so I got the really big roaches Mercy. that have wings. Yeah, it's, it's not fun down here. So we all know them. So, brothers and sisters, who would, who would want to become a roach? Who is willing to become a cockroach? Mm -mm. And furthermore, who is willing to go become a cockroach and try and save those roaches because there was some form of disease killing them off? <laughs> and as you're trying to save said roaches, they have the audacity mm. to beat you, spit on you, slap you, mock you, and then kill you on a cross. Mm. Who's willing to do this for roaches? Mm. And this is what Jesus Christ did for you and me. Yes. Yes. We didn't, we didn't ask for him God to do so that. For God so loved the world. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. That whosoever believeth in him shall not so, perish, but have everlasting life. It's amazing because we didn't even ask him to do it, right? Mm, no, we, we, did we didn't. Not. We didn't confess one sin. We didn't repent of anything. We weren't even alive when he did this, but he did it for us. Knowing that we would come and do the things it is that we do in this world today. He, 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 he did it anyway so that we, as we see that, that love, that we may realize it, it's not because of our repentance that he loves us, but he reveals that love to us in order, in order that we may repent. So we don't, we don't, we don't wait to, to, to do this, but, 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 we, but once the spirit works in our heart, the, the, the supernatural thing for us to do is to repent. I'll read a couple of statements and then I'm going to close down right here in Steps of Christ on page 27. This stuff is so sweet. It says, it, it, it is true that men sometimes become ashamed of their sinful ways and give up some of their evil habits before uh, they are conscious that they are uh, being drawn to Christ. But whenever they make an effort to reform from a sincere uh, desire to do the right, it is the power of Christ that is actually drawing them. And so if you have any relatives or friends that you find are, are saying, oh, I'm not really interested in Christ or whatever, but they but their life is changing. That's actually the work of Jesus Christ in their heart. As we read in page 26 of Steps of Christ, paragraph three, it says that Christ is the source of every right impulse. It is that glory of God, his character and his loveliness, seeing something better than I, ourselves, which is a, a, a ray of the glory of God that penetrates into our soul. It is that that makes painfully distinct to us the defects and deformity of our character and the realization of our great need of the character of the lovely Jesus to be reproduced in us. And when our soul is touched with that, when our soul is touched with that, then we are going to seek harmony with Christ. We're going to seek oneness with Christ. But we have to first feel our need. We have to feel our need. So you that's listening, do you feel your need? He who fails, he who falls rather, into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need. If you don't feel your need, then you have to say, Lord, take pride out of my heart. Take pride out of my heart because pride leads to destruction. And I want to repent from that. Not because I don't want to experience the destruction, but show me. I want to understand your love. Do you, do you right. understand the love of God towards you? Pride feels no need. And so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give we need to feel our need and we need to make absolutely no delay don't procrastinate make no delay repent turn away from your wicked ways choose christ this day it's decision time will you repent the last thing i'll read is taken for steps of christ on page 33 in paragraph 2 it says every act of transgression every neglect or rejection 
of the grace of Christ is reacting upon yourself. There's a reaction. You may not see it, but there's a reaction upon you every time you reject or neglect Christ. It is what? The hardening of the heart. The depraving of the will. It's the deterioration of your mind. The benumbing of the understanding. And not only making you less inclined to yield, but less capable of yielding to the tender pleading of God's Holy Spirit. There's absolutely no reason in this world for, for any of us to not continue to move along in our Christian experience because the love of God has been displayed to us, has been seen. But you got to study him for yourself. You got to seek and search for him for yourself and you got to know him for you. I, 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 I know God to the degree that I know God that has brought me to the experience that I have personally. But but character and experience is not transferable. You got to take that thoughtful hour each and every day yourself with God. And you have to say, Lord, God. Give me the desire to love you and to know you because we're told them again in Romans chapter three that no man seeks after God. But if there is that impulse in you that comes from Christ, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Allow him who is beginning the work to finish the work, because the next thing that he wants to do in your life right now is to lead you to repentance. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the one that's writing your story. No longer you. So let go of that motivational speaker who was telling you, you write your story. No, you no, do not do that. You're going to write a nightmare. What you want to do, a terrible story, a horror story, some type of goosebumps what you want is you want jesus mm -hmm. to write your story let christ amen, write your amen. story and in that he will reveal his glory because that's what he's trying to do in these last days reveal his glory through you and through your life and through your experience that when those people look at you then they will behold the loveliness of jesus and they will be changed brother giovanni i'll leave you with the last word and then we'll pray do you have any closing thought? Any 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 final thought here? Brothers and sisters, repentance is a gift from God. Don't reject it. Amen. Don't reject it. Don't neglect it. Accept Don't it. Don't neglect it. Amen. Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you blessed us with to be able to consider your word. And to seek after you, we realize that this is not our work, but rather it is the work of your Holy Spirit. We ask that to the person that's listening right now, God, that you may continue to work in their hearts and transform them and lead them to repentance day by day. Let them not think for one moment. Let us not think for one moment that oh, there's nothing that we need to repent of. If we think that, Lord, that we may realize that we need to repent of that thought, that we may realize that as we continue to look at the beauty and the matchless charms of Jesus Christ, the perfection of the intricacies of his character, that we may see the defects and the deformities of ours. But Lord, we we would not be discouraged about our defects and the issues in our character when, because as we behold Christ, we see what he has done for us and that he has lived the perfect version of our life. Lord, we look unto Jesus to make that life a living reality in us today, even right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.